That's the fucking thing, isn't it? You know, I saw like David Attenborough the other week. He was like, no, I'm off Instagram, you know? And I was like, <laughs> Attenborough's had to give it a rip. Attenborough's like, he's out, he's out. And it's like, smug bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of this fucking bin fire. This is Raf Rundle. Welcome to Enemies, Friends Like These. This is uh, Lee S. Saudi. You're with the enemy, Friends Like These. The tune that we made together, Ample Change, came out of just bumping into each other around gigs and this and that, and always kind of chatting about music, I think. And then I moved into my new studio, I invited Leas round, and round you came, and we hung, we hung out. You came, and you, were, you had mixes of stuff from the last record that you were just finishing off. I remember hearing Taste Good with the Money. Yeah. And feeling excited about it. And I had a, a drum loop that we kind of sung along to, and we were we were talking about George Michael, as I think you were a lot in that. That was very much your your George Michael period, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, late twenty nineteen. Yeah, yeah. Might have been late twenty eighteen. It was started quite a long time before it was finished. That tune, wasn't it? Yeah, it was real sporadic sessions. It was like you know a couple of hours once a year. Yeah, <laughs> <A> few years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, slow burn. Yeah, we do. We do a, a session. We need to get started on that record, Christmas twenty twenty five anthem that we've. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The what? The one about the ghouls in uh, the crossbones. The ghouls in the crossbones. Yeah, maybe. Now, yeah, that was an original the, idea. The pink, the pink fangs. That's right. I had my the initial thing I approached Leas with was a song that I had at writing that I thought you'd be good for, you'd have the right ideas for, which was about sleeping with the ghost of a prostitute from the Crossbones graveyard near Water, uh, near London Bridge. I don't know exactly why, what possessed me. I'd been reading about that place and the Southwark mysteries and all of that. So that was what I approached was, oh yeah, I've got this idea, but then we ended up just doing something else. And that song's still sitting there waiting to be looked at actually. Maybe we should do that one day. Waiting to be birthed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but the ample change one, you know, you had you had a little, a little hook for that. A little hook, slightly, slightly different lyric. Just slightly, not much. Slightly different. Yeah. It was a strange inspiration that one. Yeah. <laughs> you could explain. Well, we could explain, but it would it might ruin the mystery of it. Yeah, and yeah. And kind of put a few people off their breakfast, probably. So, Raph, what was the uh, creative process behind the, the new album? <laughs> oh, uh, it was long, torturous, shameful, torrid, uh, exciting. Oh, exciting. Let's focus on that. On the exciting bits. Well, making music does have its very exciting moments when you kind of have an idea and then it starts to come together and become something even more than you might have thought or it leads you down a path that you hadn't expected then that's always fun and I think like working with other people is always good so I remember the afternoon we wrote the words for this the, the ample change to I, I, I remember it as a really um, like fun kind of half hour or something just sort of sort of around bullshitting and then just just about managing to kind of make it happen and there's that i enjoy that kind of game when you've got a, when you have a tune and a framework and then like making putting the words to it and you know falling over and being a bit ridiculous and then finding something that fits anyway the creative process of the album i mean yeah, is is like very long and very varied. The songs don't happen one particular way, or it'll, it'll be someone will come with an idea, or I'll have an idea for something to nick from somewhere else, or reappropriate, I suppose, or reimagine is the is the right way of putting it, isn't it? Now, so you, so you don't get lifted. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm sort of running dry. Yeah, I mean, the the creative process. I mean, you you know. It brings well, that it brings that feeling on, doesn't it? Yeah, panic. But running dry. Yeah. 
<laughs> Run so dry. And then the minute you've done one, you have to... you got to make another one. You're supposed to do another one. you got to make another fucking record when you made the last one. Yeah, yeah. You're all happy about the one you made, and then you put it out, and then and people might listen to it. That's fun. And yeah. make people even like it. That's good. You might get to do a gig. You might get to do a few gigs, or you might not. Or you might not. And then you just got to make another one. And then you got to make another one, yeah. And yeah. all, you know, and everybody well, gets to listen to it for free, which is yeah. great. They're just having a free ride on us. So, Lewis, what are you currently working on? I, I, t- I tend to sort of work on, uh, like, like, lots of different things at once, and thus never really finish anything. You're working on a deadline for something at the moment, right? I'm working on a deadline for a piece of writing at the moment. I've veered off into the into the, the literary sphere. Yeah. You know? that, so all of this is just basically some you, you realise you can't be fingering your bum hole on a stage forever. Yeah. And now you're, now you're going to do the pencil squeezing thing instead. That's uh, basically the whole of the last 10 years was just a... Con- I mean, it wasn't an accident. It was consciously lowering the bar... Lowering of the bar, lowering expectations to like a chronic level of sort of just dismay. Yeah, and then like then then even even an average passage of like even an average couple of paragraphs will seem slightly impressive. Oh, like oh yeah, whoa! He used to do that, and now he's written. Yeah, yeah, that's that's been. He's read a book. That's been the game plan the whole the whole way, you know. So I was like, well, I don't really have, I don't have the means to get, you know, to fully inhabit that kind of literary fantasy. Do you know what I mean? It's of course you do. It's one of those. It's it's a path that's it's bad. It's badly trod. Do you know what I mean? So I think it was you don't want to be of sort of de- self degradation in the extreme. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then make the shift. You know, but no, I mean, I, it will be nice to get back in the studio and do some music again soon. It's it's nice here too. Yeah, I do. Built, I do. Built this big fucking machine, man. It's amazing. Like a two meter frame out of scaffold. Yeah, it's wicked. And everyone's like banging away on it. Yeah. Yeah, it's really good fun. Yeah. Not, they've got no songs yet. Now, there's, there's actually, we've got nine songs. So that's good. Some of them need words, though. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but no, there are songs. Well, and actually, that's quite a discrepancy between zero. And nine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no more than none that you haven't heard before, in a way, probably. You know, it's all the same stuff off that playlist that's been kicking around for a while. But they come along. And then we've got this, we've got the weekend off here now to just sort of jam, you know, we're not recording, but we've got all the stuff set up and we've got all the drum machines and synths in the control room and like got it all. Yeah. Yeah, it's a vibe. So um, yeah, come, I, I, down, come down this weekend, take the weekend off. Oh man, I absolutely can. I can. I, cause I, I was up. At, I was up at my mum's sixtieth last weekend. Oh yeah. So and it's just put. It did just put like a four day dent in in everything. In your hectic writing schedule. Well, it's got like you know what I mean because Ade- Adele's got all this, all this material. You know what I mean. I'm working in tandem with another writer, so it's like for me to sort of just not. Is, bother. What's the book about? Well, that needs to be revealed. Huh? What is the piece of writing that you're working on? Are you allowed to talk about it? Yeah, it's about sex therapy. Okay. It's about, it's a bit, it's a... It's a it some sort of manual? I wouldn't say manual, no. It's more like, you know, well, it's part manual, part confessional. Okay. You know? But that's all I can say about it now. That's I can't, all right. I can't say anything else about it now. I'm not going to push. Handbook. A handbook confessional. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Raph, what motivates you as an artist? Money, power, <laughs> money. Yeah. money, power, sex, magic, drugs. Mm-hmm. What is it about money, power, sex, drugs, magic that you find so alluring that? Well, I don't know how I'm going to get any of those things otherwise. I haven't got any other hustles. Mm -hmm. Working one way or another in music since I was about 17. What about politics? Politics and music now, bollocks. Nah, I'm not having 
well, I, I haven't got the wit. Tech. Tech. Yeah. Big pharma. Um, um, that's a motivation. Tech. I don't know. I'm not into tech, really. Tech's not my bag. Useful, mind. Sort of. Uh, what else motivates me? Well, just sort of fear and... Uh, fear, of, fear, of, fear of failure, fear of death. Failure, fear of death, fear of humiliation. Those aren't motivators so much as inhibitors, but they're definitely there. Well, they, they, they manage to ride both horses, you know? I think those well, things... Exactly. Uh, angst. I wish I was more motivated as an artist, you know? I wish yeah. I had more things that I was like, I've got to do this. I have lots of, like, kind of pub ideas, and I kind of managed to get quite a lot of them done, like more than other people that I know, perhaps. But still, I think I could, I always feel like you could do more, be more mad, be more uncompromising, give less of a fuck, and just kind of do more, like more arty pop shit. But there's no, I don't know, there's no kind of platform for that in, in the sort of traditional music industry anymore, I don't think. Yeah. Obviously, obviously, you can do whatever, you, you know, it's like TikTok. Maybe I need to get on like inventing more TikTok crazes and become like a full-time meme lunatic. I think that's where it's that's where it's all going, sort of bite-sized culture. Bitcoin, you know, you need to get non-fungible, basically. Do you want the non-fund of the, the fat white family coined their first non-fungible token yet? Eh. <laughs> No, no, Nathan's Nathan's in talks. I reckon he's the guy. Nathan's in talks. Brian, Des you know? Brian Destiny. Yeah, he's but he's I mean he's taken a bit of a battering on the crypto markets in the last week, but he will rise again, I'm sure. Is he a bit blockchained? Oh, he's deeply blockchained. Yeah, 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 yeah. I am sort of by just by my adjacency to his person. I'm also yeah. blockchained a little bit. Like I've, I've been. I've been I've been listening to a lot of his his his, his crypto monologues. <laughs> got no choice. I mean, it's it's kind of a step up from the constant conspiracy theorizing, you know. Well, yeah. I mean, on a grand scale, on, and even on a personal one, he's quite good with those, isn't he, Brian? Yeah. I mean, there's only yeah, so many times trying to kill him, basically. The Great Reset. You know what I mean? It gets old. Crypto, at least, there's a, it's basically just the, it's basically just the dogs, isn't it, or the horses? But it's, I, yeah. Yes, in, yes, absolutely. Crypto is the dogs. It's pretty much the dogs, you know. I, I could put a couple of hundred quid in myself, actually. Yeah. You know, I'm just going to leave it in there for like 10 years. Yeah, I think that's, I think that might be, you know, something to do with it anyway, isn't it? I'm not sure how we got onto that. No. Nah. No. Yeah, motivate art, artistic motivation artistic motivation yeah 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 so money was the first one money was the first one i just think isn't it mad to to get into music for money as isn't it there's an oxymoron somewhere in the heart of that absolutely i given, was given that we're not allowed to perform live and that nobody buys records anymore exactly well that's the thing i mean i was i was being silly really but it would be nice to like make make a proper living doing it but hmm. I, don't know how, I don't know how you how people do necessarily you get paid for basically being uh, yourself that's the that's the appeal isn't it i suppose you know it's not money it's money just for just for being being for, that dude having been born with uh, this certain uh, career it's a fucking disgrace then isn't it really it's what fucking a, what a way to carry on like, I expect yeah. to be paid for being myself. Yeah, I want to be simultaneously sort of like, like validated in every one of my opinions and actions, but also paid at the same, at the same time. Jesus. Do you know what I mean? I want, to be, I want to be put on a pedestal and paid to sit there for a little bit, actually. Yeah. I want you to pay me. So I want you to love me, and I want you to pay me for that. I want you to pay me for that adoration that you're also giving, giving to me. Sounds that's, great. That's basic. It sounds wicked, isn't it? <laughs> it sounds wicked. But like when I got into it, it wasn't it wasn't completely fucked like it is now. And now it's like, no. well, you've got no. more you've got more chance of like not earning a penny and like 
the, you know, complete ruination financially, yeah. so socially. It's like a, a kind of um, reputationally, reputationally sa savaged. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hotbed of, of oh. paranoia. It's, it's like, it's like everything is everything we got into it for has, 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 has just completely inverted. And I, and I, and so it should really, because it was perverse to go down that route in the first place, you know? Well, yeah, but it didn't, it's gone too far the other way. It's just fascism now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but it's a karmic, it's a karmic like reflex, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah, like okay. all these bards and knob ends. I've been like, right, I want to, yeah, that's what I want to do. Actually. I want to get put on a, I want you to pay me to put me on a, you know, that's that's where I want to be, you know? Yeah. And it's like, and then you wake up 10 years later, there's no money in it. Everybody's getting like canceled. There's all kinds of mad shit. You're not allowed to go on stage anymore. It's yeah. like the anti, so it's like every, everything, the opposite of everything you wanted in the first place. But maybe that's exactly. That's what, what, you, that's what you get. That's what we fucking deserve. More of it, I think. <laughs> more of it. You know, I want more. I want, you want, I want more less. privation and suffering. Yeah, I want less. I, I want less. I demand. I want less now. <laughs> <laughs> I demand less. I demand less. <laughs> you know, I need to be crushed. So at least we. So we Crush me. Whatever's burnt. Crush me under the wheels. It, it might have some dignity. It might have a whiff of dignity. Whatever comes next, you know. It might do if you survive. I mean, I think it's important, it's crucial that we don't survive. Right. So, so got any crazy gig stories, Lias? Uh, nah. What, got... what, what was your first ever show? My first ever show was in a pub called The Eagle in Camden. It was an open mic night. Oh, yeah. And I was just, I'd just moved to London and was at Halls. I'd had never sung in front of anybody before. And I just thought it was one of those things you could magically do once you were sat down in front of a microphone. Yeah, you just got pissed and sat in front of a microphone. And I went and I tried to play. Uh, I think it was the Boxer by Simon and Garfunkel. Yeah, when I'd never practiced it, I'd never sang even privately. I was too embarrassed, you know. But I just thought, once you're in front of the mic, wow, it's bound to come off, you know. And then I sat down and I was shitting myself so violently that the only chord I could play was was G. And then I started trying to sing, and I was immediately just like hounded from the stage and like quite savagely humiliated. Oh wow! It was good. It was a good. Oh, uh, right. It was a good beginning. That's we need to get back to that. Yeah. Okay. That's the sort of upsetting, humiliating experience that you really need to be. I mean, you know, it, it maybe it made you the man you are today. Well, it's it's you know, things have improved slightly. Here I am in bed, two in the afternoon, three in the <laughs> afternoon. You know. I've had a bath. I've had a bath and gotten back into bed. Yeah, that's luxury, boy. It's all right. It's all well. This is the one thing about the writing gig is there's just no point if you're mildly hungover. So it makes it easier to just sit on your ass doing nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's like it's better if you don't do anything. You can't, you can't get it together to write if you've got a bad hangover or any kind of hangover. No, not like that kind of writing. You, you no. need a, you need a good night's sleep and a, and, and a strong cup of coffee and a get on with it sort of thing yeah you know? otherwise you just send yourself into a into a spin because you'll you'll start fucking with the text that's already there yeah your brain just don't make those connections do you know what i mean what's your worst gig your best gig or your first My gig first, best gig ah uh, sheesh uh, i had a stage invasion at love box in victoria park one time that was quite good fun Sorted. yeah there'd been there'd been some sort of incident at one of the main gates and so all of the security had disappeared yeah like a couple of kids got on stage and no one stopped them and then the rest just you can see it on youtube actually it's, it's up there and then the rest just realize basically the crowd realize that it's on and no no there's not going to be any consequence so it just and people love getting up don't they everyone's just dancing about and it was mental yeah. this whole nearly fell in it kind of got got heavy <laughs> yeah so that was good fun. Yeah. Worst gig. I've had I've had plenty of terrible ones. I'm trying to think of like if there's any like real disasters or total humiliations. I mean, probably too many, but I was pissed, so it doesn't really didn't didn't You don't really feel it. People would say, Oh yeah, I saw you. You go, Oh fuck. Yeah. You know. That's, yeah. that's those days are behind me now. I hang out making folk music with recovering addicts.
could bring it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's about the only that's the, the only treatment for it, isn't it? Well, it's a kind of you know, it's it's a dignified thing for a man in his forties to do. Rap. So, who's your favourite artist of all time? Bob Marley. Bob Marley. Bob Marley. I'm not even being silly. No, I do love Bob Marley. I don't know. I don't. It's a hard question to answer. That I have lots of Bob Marley records, and I do find that I do go back to them. You know, like you do with records that you've loved since you were a kid or whatever, and they kind of provide some sort of stability. And, and and also, there's always you know his words are brilliant. Bob Marley, who else do I like? I mean, you know, all the big stuff. Hendrix, The Kinks, a bit of everything. But yeah, like a single artist, yeah, probably Bob Marley. There you go. Kendrick Lamar, I rate very, very highly. He's yeah. at it. He's right at it. What about you? Who's your favourite? Uh, probably Bob Dylan, isn't it? Such boring, generic answers, isn't it? Bob Marley and Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> It's like asking footballers, like, what's your favourite music? It's just R&B, isn't it? That's it. <laughs> I've, stopped, I've stopped listening to, to, to music during the pandemic. Have you? Not completely, but yeah. quite significantly. I just listen to, like, background... Ambient stuff. Ambient stuff. I tend to read more. I don't know what music just hasn't made a great deal of sense to me during the well, lockdown. So much of music is about sort of like togetherness and life and all that stuff, isn't it? Like, about movement, generally. Yeah. Around, like I don't want to hear about like wild summer nights or you know, whatever the fuck it is. Do you know what I mean? Or, or even like m- morbid like downtown New York or... I, yeah, any of it. I don't want to hear about anything. I just... Uh, I, I, I think it's a hard time to try and write songs, honestly, because it's like, yeah, what are you writing about? Aside from sort of, I mean, there's all the sort of like angst and loneliness and, you know, but there's all, you know, there's the sort of rumbling bigger picture of a fucking pandemic that's killing millions of people and keeping us all locked up. No one wants to hear about that, really, I don't think. I'm not going to, I can't. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the great, greatest record in the next 50 years is being made right now in response to it. But Maybe, but the next 50 years will be a steady decline. Into... As, as, as the, the global consumerism runs. Well, rapidly. yeah, like, it, it, you know, the, the, the high point that we reached or whatever in the, you know, when modernity's kind of peak in the 60s, yeah. wherever you... you 60s, 70s, play. 80s, it was the best bit, wasn't it, probably? In pop music, yeah. Those those icons will only weigh heavy, more and more well, heavy. The internet on. ruined everything. It, yeah, yeah, and then, and then, yeah, and then we have a kind of, like, utter kind of atomization and everybody's just... No, nobody attaches themselves to a subculture anymore, just, like, random political activism for whatever sort of strain of injustice it is that they feel... It's really, it, 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 at, atomizing is the word, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's the illusion of, of, of some kind of cohesion and community online. It's, it's seductive, but in reality, we're becoming like more extremely alone than ever. Well, getting fed what you think, you, what you, yeah, it's just grim. I need to get off a bloody mobile phone, honestly. But you oh, can, you can. Until, yeah. until you've yeah. got like, you know, I, I, so I remember seeing that thing. The the Irvin Welsh thing, you know, about cancel culture or whatever, and there was MIA was on it, right? And she was like, "The most creative thing you can do right now is get the fuck off social media." And it's like, "Well, that's fine if you're like, cash. if you've got the fucking cash in the first place to get, but otherwise, where where exactly are you?" Where, it, the rest of us are trying to sell our shit on that voyeuristic hellscape, Maya. Yeah, it's the fucking it's market for us. It's the market square. Like, you literally can't opt out. I get to a point where I'm like, I just want off. I want off. This is all fucking hideous bullshit. But at the same time, like, if I want to publish something or I want to try and flog a couple of T-shirts, then... Well, be there, mate. Yeah. In fact, I got T-shirts just gone up yesterday. Everyone. Enemy.com. <laughs> <laughs> Bio-Linky, yeah? Bio-Linky. 
link it, link it on, on the socials. <laughs> it on the socials. This has been friends like these on QVC. That's the fucking thing, isn't it? You know, I saw like David Attenborough the other week. He was like, no, I'm off Instagram, you know? And I was like, <laughs> Attenborough's had to give it a rest. Attenborough's like, he's out, he's out. And it's like, smug bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of this fucking bin fire. Ta ta, kids. You know, I'd be fucking out in a out in a heartbeat if I could. It makes it makes me so fucking ill. Mm.